great. So now we're going to get started with our, um, our wrap-up from our elected officials. And first on board is our Senator, Steve Hershey. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all very much, and thank you for taking time out of your day to come and join us. Um, we've had a very interesting uh, legislative session uh, this year. Um, again, the first year of a new term. And um, one of the best things was the first year of Governor Larry Hogan being there. So it was something that we were all very excited to, to hear and work with. Um, session started off in a very um, bipartisan type manner. Um, everybody was, was uh, very cordial. Everybody was looking at working together. You know, the spirit of cooperation was everywhere. And um, as we moved through the session, things unfortunately changed a little bit, right up until the last day when we had a lot of discrepancy about where the budget was and, and what the budget ended up doing and not doing as opposed to what the governor had, uh, had expected it to do. So um, I'll just really kind of mention a little bit about that, um, where we were with the budget. Um, the, the budget, the governor put in a very fiscally responsible budget. Um, one of his main goals was he wanted to re reduce the structural deficit within a single year. And this was something that he wanted to do in order that in the following years in his budgets he would be able to provide some tax relief, which is again what we all thought and what he believes and we believe is something that the, uh, the voters wanted and the people of Maryland wanted to, to finally get some tax relief. So in order to do that he had to get a uh, structural deficit down to zero to give him some uh, ability to, to maneuver and, and reduce some taxes. And, and um, we met a lo lot of opposition in the, in the last week of session with the budget. Um, the, uh, the House leadership with the Speaker of the House mainly kind of leading the charge wanted to only reduce that over two years. And um, basically he wanted to do that for the reason of being able to fully fund education. Now when the governor presented his budget, he put more money into public education than any governor in the history of Maryland. So he was very comfortable with the amount of money that was going in to, into education and thought that, you know, with, with the way that the budget was written, more money there, everybody should be comfortable with it. But there is something called the uh, Geographical Cost of Education Index, GCEI. And in, in the governor's budget, that was only funded at 50%. And in prior years, uh, the last seven years, uh, last six years actually, in the, under the O'Malley administration, they had funded that at 100%. But what was interesting is the, the previous two governors, Governor O'Malley and Governor Ehrlich, in their first years only funded that at 0% zero, zero for one year and then 30% uh, the next year. So Governor uh, Hogan actually went into his first budget uh, funding that particular index at a higher rate than any other governor had done in their first year. So again, was very comfortable with that. Unfortunately, the leadership in the House, I, I said, again, was not, in, not uh, comfortable with that, didn't think it was enough. So they used that as the bargaining chip with the governor's legislative agenda. And um, it was very important for the governor to be able to put some, some of his bills through. He had a, a bill for uh, charter education that was able to get uh, put through. He got his uh, rain tax repeal put through. He got a bill that would um, provide tax relief to veterans pushed through and um, and uh, he had one other bill. I just can't remember. But anyways, w I thought I said charter school. Charter school's bill. But that was that that legislative package was important to, to the governor. So what they were trying to do through that is to uh, to negotiate and. Um, and come to some type of compromise. And in fact, the Saturday before Signy die, the governor had met with both the Speaker of the House and the Senate President, provided this compromise, got pushed back, and they said, we're, not, we're done talking, we've got the budget that we want, and here's what it is. And the main difference of the budget that, that we all voted for early in the session, and a lot of times you might hear that you know, when, the, when the budget first came out of committee, um, I think only 10 people in the House of, Rep House of Delegates voted against it, the Senate voted for it uh, unanimously, but that was the, basically the fiscally responsible gov uh, budget that the governor had put forward. The one that came out of conference committee at the end had, again, the structural deficit not being fixed in a year, um, and had what they called a fencing off of $200 million. And that money is set aside that the governor now can fully fund GCEI if he chooses to, could also fund the 2% uh, pay increases that were given to the state employees that the governor had cut back and also help a little bit more with the pension funding, which is something that the governor had tried to do. <clears throat> so 
This money is being set aside. The governor can now choose to, to decide if he wants to spend that or not. And that's one of the uh, debates and conversations that he'll be having over the, over the next uh, few weeks or few months leading into the July 1st uh, fiscal year. So overall, you know, I, I think that this, the session with regard to the budget, although the end game wasn't exactly what we had looked for, um, it certainly had some positives. You know, there were no tax increases in it. There were no fee increases in it. And what the governor said and what we ended up getting out of this was that $16.4 billion of revenue was coming in, and he put a budget there that was only going to spend $16.4 billion. So there was no increased spending. And, and I think from that perspective, there are very good things with the budget. Um, for a couple of things that, that we looked in, and, and my colleagues are going to come up and talk, and um, we've got very diverse uh, delegation here as far as the um, committees that we sit on. And as we've come and talked to you a number of times, we always say that, you know, the committees are really where a lot of the work gets done. And um, the committee I sat on this year, uh, for the first time this year, was uh, the uh, Finance Committee. And uh, we dealt with a lot of bills that had to do with uh, public utilities, uh, um, work, uh, work regulations, business regulations, health care issues. And um, one of the, the things that you don't, <clears throat> don't necessarily hear a lot about is, um, is the bills that are defeated in committee. And um, we always kind of hear the, the bills that have, that have passed, uh, the headline-making bills. But there are a few bills in, in committee that uh, we were able to, to defeat. And I like to kind of bring these up because they're important to, uh, to the business community. And when we talk to the chambers, we like to talk a little bit about some of the legislation that affects the business community. And um, the first bill that you might have heard a lot about was the uh, paid sick leave bill. And this required all businesses to provide their employees with 56 hours per year of paid sick leave. Now, a lot of times you might look at that and say, well, that's not such a, you know, a bad idea or a terrible thing to do. Or, you know, many businesses might say, we already do that. But the fact is, the devil's in the details with these types of bills. And what really happened with that bill is that you get the 56 hours. Each employee now has to get the 56 hours, but they can use it for a number of different things. And it's not just being sick, but it has to do with uh, potentially meeting with counseling services, uh, taking care of uh, individual family members that might not be direct family members, uh, meeting with attorneys, very different types of things other than your your standard thought of what sick leave might be. And it also said that there was, there was no, uh, no prior notice that had to be provided, nor if you were only out for two days did you have to provide a note or any kind of a, a backup for that. So um, that was a bill that we really thought was onerous for the business community, and, and we were able to defeat that one in committee. Um, I expect we'll probably see that again over the next uh, few years because it was, a <clears throat> it was an initiative of, um, of President Obama and uh, the, the uh, presenter of that bill from the um, Senate Finance Committee was the chair of the majority party. She had actually met with the uh, president at the, um, his State of the Union address, and she was very excited with that bill. But as I said, we were able to, to kind of show that the reality of that type of bill really doesn't fit too much. Um, another bill was <clears throat> basically the, the follow-up to um, minimum wage. What they had the increase for that last year. This one would um, basically re, uh, repeal the tax or the tip credit for restaurant employees. Again, a very important type of thing if you've owned a restaurant and how you're paying your employees. But what a lot of these bills tend to have that, um, that they don't, I think they don't realize is the unintended consequences of, of this legislation. I, I believe that they're trying to do good. I believe they're trying to put more money into the employees' pockets, but I don't believe that they fully understand um, the unintended consequences. And we were able in that hearing to bring up um, what's going on in Seattle, Washington right now. The uh, minimum wage went up to $15. The tip credit was repealed up there and restaurants are closing. People are losing their jobs and it's having the exact opposite effect, I think, of what they are expected it to do. So we were able to, to kill that bill as well too. And I, you know, I think again, that was a good thing for businesses. Uh, again, on top of uh, what we've talked about before, no increases for taxes, no increases on regulations. Um, so, so I think it was a very good year for businesses. There was, there was one other thing that um, the governor did put together, or the governor didn't put together, but the legislature put together. Um, three, three years ago when I was in the House, we started the uh, Business Climate Work Group. And the Speaker of the House kind of joined that committee, got everybody together. The Senate wasn't participating in it at the time. 
but um, last year they made it a, um, a, a committee that um, both the Senate and the House had members in, and it became known as the Augustine Commission. And the Augustine Commission came out with a um, number of pieces of legislation. There are five pieces of legislation, actually, that were aimed towards making Maryland a more uh, business-friendly state. And um, while the main component of that that we had all looked for and hoped we were going to see was some type of a tax reduction, that part is being pushed off until September, or, or at least we're going to readjoin and, and come back and, and, and discuss that issue in September. But we are going to do some things that are going to, um, again, help with some business regulations. We'll put a, a, um, a committee or council together that will look at any new legislation that comes across um, and what type of legislation or what type of regulations that might impose on businesses. We're going to basically restructure the Department of Business and Economic Development to be the Department of Commerce. Um, elevate a secretary in that position to give that person uh, a little bit more of an overarching uh, level of responsibility with all of the other secretaries and really kind of put a focus uh, into governments, into government and, and the business climate. So, you know, I think there were some very good things, again, that happened for businesses. Um, there's, again, we could probably talk about a number of different things. I was just having some conversations up here. It really was an exciting session for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think we, uh, you know, your delegation, I think that we really did a, a very good job in representing the interests of um, of this uh, of this district and of the uh, county here, um, I'll talk about one real quick bill that I was able to get passed that was a, um, a result of a, 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 le a line of communication or a cons constituent issue um, right here off a of spider neck or spider web road. Um, <clears throat> There were two households that were doing a uh, solar panel project. They had somebody come in and put solar panels on their house, and you know they 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 got all the were you know sold the benefits of doing that. But when it came time to interconnect into the existing utility lines, uh, Delmarva Power came back and said, "We don't have the capacity to handle that power." So we looked at it the end of last year. We came forward with a bill this year, and it was a simple bill, but it, it addresses, you know, again, a, a concern that we've had and a concern that once we brought it up as, as an issue that we were having in Queen Anne's County, we found out that it was happening in a lot of different places. But now all the bill decides, or says now is that a solar panel installer will have to contact and get approval from a utility company prior to the installation of solar panels. So again, doesn't sound like a, a big deal, but again, it's just one of those things that come uh, as solar panels are growing, we're starting to see more and more of those projects. We wanna make sure that at the end of the day that the uh, resident and the consumer is protected and not getting sold something that they can't end up using. So uh, I'll cut it off with that. I know that uh, we're gonna come up and do some question and answers afterwards. But again, I just wanna uh, thank you all again for, for coming out there and again, let you know how, how much of an honor it is for me to to serve you and to to represent uh, this district and, and Queen Anne's County down in the General Assembly so thank you very much thank you Senator Hershey and next we'll have delegate Jay Jacobs come up <laughs> thank you very much um, and good morning and uh, as you were uh, Making your pitch about the Corsica Hills this morning, I was wondering if you give out points like Marriott points, you know, for for booking to stay here. <laughs> Sounded so good, I thought. <laughs> Sounded so good, I thought you were giving points. So um, it's good to be here again and uh, and and uh, give give you all an idea of our legislative wrap up. Um, I, I'm still on the same committee I was on the, the last term and, and it lasts four years. It was called Environmental Matters. This year they renamed it uh, Environment and Transportation, which we have, we've handled a lot of transportation bills uh, when it was named Environmental Matters, but there was a change in, uh, in committee chairs and a restructuring of the committee and it, it is now known as Environment and Transportation. So uh, for, uh, in, in response uh, to uh, Senator Hershey, you know, I think that what we do the best in Annapolis is, is as I refer to, as gut and kill. That, that's our job over there to really try and, and get rid of some of these egregious bills that are brought forward. You know, some of the, uh, uh, the bills, and especially in my committee, that are anti-ag. Uh, we actually had a day this year, it was Friday, uh, 
the 13th, uh, uh, March 13th, Friday the 13th, we called it anti-ag day because every bill that day were really bills against agriculture. And uh, this year, our committee, uh, I think we did a great job of pretty much killing every one of those bills. They, uh, they had a lot of consequences uh, against ag. And uh, you know, some of these new uh, delegates that, were, that came in this year, we had 62 new ones. We didn't know what to expect, and uh, I think they uh, they must have gotten quite a bit of money from uh, Food and Water Watch and, and different groups, and uh, they held they held true to their word that they would bring these bills in, and uh, once again go kind of target you know the ag industry and more specifically on the eastern shore poultry industry. Um, but they didn't they didn't fare well. We were able to either. Uh, Killed the bill, or, or they were uh, convinced after the hearing it would be in their best interest to withdraw it. So uh, this year, um, it was what I would say is success in in the world of uh, agriculture, especially here on the shore. Um, we, uh, like I said, this year uh, with the restructuring last the last term, I had my two subcommittees were agriculture and and uh, natural resources this year they combined those two into one and then put me on uh, the transportation subcommittee which we hear a lot of bills i mean transportation legislation is a huge part of that committee um you know we're also in the homeowner associations uh, uh ethics lead paint uh it, it, it's a very diverse committee and uh there were a lot of bills in there in transportation and and this year, we, we there was a lot of legislation killed. I can tell you, um, some things got out, but there was a, a great deal of legislation brought in that that didn't see daylight at the end, and and that's what we always say is is a success for us. Um, I uh, got a few more appointments now that I'm in my second term. I'm the chair of the uh, Republican Caucus in the House, and I I think my colleague forgot to say he's now the whip in the Senate, but, uh, you know, getting in our second term, you know, you get a few perks uh, uh, getting in there. Um, the first week of session, I, w I went into the Speaker's office and I asked if I could be put on the AELR committee, you know, the Regulatory Oversight Committee, and the Speaker laughed. He said, well, Delegate, I got to tell you, no one's ever asked for that before. <laughs> it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of work, but you know, in my committee, in, uh, in environment, uh, dealing with uh, waterman issues and uh, agriculture, it's a highly regulated industry on both sides. There's an enormous amount of uh, regulations that are put in that, that doesn't go through the legislative process that really have an adverse effect. So I felt, you know, that uh, it's where I should be. We lost some people there last year after the election. Uh, some people from the shore and, and different parts of the state, um, and it's uh, it's an it's amazing to see just how many regulations are introduced every week. I mean, there were 70 that uh, prior Governor uh, O'Malley introduced after the election in November, and pretty much every week since session began, uh, it's about four to six on average new regulations proposed every week. So it's a uh, it's something that you really have to keep your eye on because there's a lot of things that are done through that process that, that like I said, we don't do as a, as a, as a bill that's presented. So uh, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of reading, but uh, I've already seen some areas of success, and uh, I'm not sorry I did that, but if it's almost like a sacrifice but some, you know, to, to have someone on there, but I think it's important for us over on the shore really to have a voice out of that 16 member committee. Um, the other thing the, uh, the governor did this year, he uh, made me the uh, house representative for the Maryland Dairy Cow uh, Industry Oversight Commission. I'm not sure what that is yet, but uh, <laughs> I'll be seeing more of Frederick County than uh, than I have in the past, since that's really the kind of the uh, the headquarters in the state for for dairy cow uh, the dairy cow industry. But uh, 
you know, I look forward to that. I always accept whatever uh, offers are made, you know, when they want to put you on something. I think it's it's in our best interest to really follow through with that um, rather than say no. If you say no once, they may, may never ask you again. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the uh, I think that the senator spoke a lot about the budget. And uh, it, for me, it was the very first time I voted for a budget. I was all excited. I put it on Facebook when it came out, <laughs> when, when the House voted on the budget. I kind of held my nose a little bit, but uh, wanted to support the new governor. And, and really, there are parts and pieces in the budget that, that uh, you know, were good. You know, there were no new taxes. There was a very, very, very little increase in, in spending. Um, and... Uh, you know, we, for those of us who have been there for uh, the previous four years, you know, it was exciting to vote for a, for a budget that didn't have an increase. It really kept uh, spending and, and whatnot in line. Uh, and as the senator said, when it got, got out of conference committee, it was a whole different creature. And uh, in the end, I voted against it. So I held true <laughs> for five, five years now that, that I just could not support a budget where the spending kind of got out of hand. Uh, I think uh, the governor did a great job in uh, in in this budget with uh, I think it's 1.4 percent um, above last year, and their uh, revenue estimates went up about three and a half percent. So those numbers are are on on the good side for a change, and uh, and hopefully next year we can address this and and really get the, everything reined in to where we can start really looking at tax, some tax benefits, some tax uh, savings. But um, it, was, uh, it was kind of a strange year to have a new governor, you know, uh, uh, from the opposite party and trying to get secretaries confirmed. They, they were holding all those off until the, until the very end. And for us that are trying to work specific legislation, with different departments, you're really, you're kind of up in the air about the old people and who's going to be the new people. And, and it was really a year where a lot of these uh, departments would come in with a letter of information rather than a letter of support or, or opposition. And some of the committee chairs were getting pretty frustrated because these departments wouldn't take a position. And, uh, and I think in some cases they, they just didn't move forward on legislation just to show a point uh, you know, of frustration. So, you know, I think it was a year, I always called it the, the Labrador year, where they kind of walk around each other and sniff a little bit and cock their legs a little bit. <clears throat> I think it was a year of really trying to do a little posturing and see what's, see who's who. Uh, you know, I think the, the speaker was, was pretty, uh, pretty much stern uh, in, his conviction of where he was going to go, and uh, and from from our view, worked uh, seemed to work uh, a little less with the governor than than the president of the Senate. So uh, for us in the House, it was a little more frustrating to to watch that uh, kumbaya melt very quickly. Um, it lasted until the budget was introduced. I think the uh, the first few days, but it was a, a year with a lot of new people and. Uh, you know, everybody trying to find their sea legs. I think next year is going to be a much better year um, with everyone being in a lot of new people, including the governor and his staff, really getting uh, accustomed to doing business in Annapolis. But uh, all in all, I think it was a pretty good year. You know, for Marylanders, there are no new taxes. And, uh, you know, that in itself is, is a good thing to be able to say. And so... I look forward to questions uh, as, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Jacobs. And next we'll hear from Delegate Steve Ahrens. Good morning. Um, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Obviously, uh, I know most of you in um, 
I am your resident delegate, Steve Ernst. Uh, it's it's kind of nice because I, I sat down there, I listened to my senator speak and my good delegate speak, and I figured I had a presentation for you. Now I, I have this much to go through. Um, <laughs> we, we use a little thing, and I'm, I'm going to probably pound on the budget right now because uh, Delegate Greist is next, and he is our expert on, in appropriation, so he'll have absolutely nothing to talk about. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I will say this: last year I was on appropriations. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, most of you know I was appointed last year, so I was elected this year. And um, I was very, very fortunate to be put on economic matters this year, which is a, a great committee for me personally because of a business background. And it's probably the most conservative committee in the whole state. Um, we're a great group of people. We have our, our ranking member has the nickname of WAMP. And WAMP means that we kill bills. Um, we had approximately two, a little over 260 bills presented in our committee this year. 140 of those actually got through. Um, nothing earth-shaking to business. A lot of those were alcohol bills, which I was on the alcohol subcommittee. I don't know why they picked me, but uh, I certainly qualified. Um, that, those were exciting things. I, I'm going to probably stay on some of the things we did in economic matters. We had to fight bills. Um, the, the senator spoke about the... Uh, uh, paid sick leave. We actually had a bill in front of us called the right to rest, meaning that uh, as a person that's working, you had a minimum of 11 hours you were not allowed to work between shifts. Um, we thought that was a little bit odd because I think a lot of people were finding themselves, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll touch on the, the employment part of, of our state right now. We are a low unemployment state, but the biggest problem is, is we're underemployed. Like six years ago, we all had jobs. We were all working, but we were making a lot more money than we're making today. So a lot of families are finding themselves having to work that second and third job at some times. So this would have precluded them from being able to do that. So we were faced with a lot of bills like that and, and taking care of type bills. Um, economic matters, uh, we, we fought some bills, and one, one specific bill, and it really goes against it. It may sound good to everybody, but supermarkets want, want to sell liquor and beer in their stores. And in Maryland, when you first see that, that sounds like it's a good idea because we can go to Florida, we can go to a lot of places. But what you had to do, and the devil is always in the details, you have to look at how Maryland is built, and we're built on a three-tier system. And had we done that, that would have given these grocery stores just mega powers to purchase and, and that would have probably taken all our local stores out of, out of the mix, which is a, a big job killer in Maryland, a big problem for us. And, and it's a business model that Maryland has conscientiously went after, and that's the, the, the way we do that. So it was, it was really geared towards the bigger stores, and it was really going to end up hurting a lot of the small businesses. So we had to go out and find that um, and, and find the reasons and give the reasons why that bill should be killed. And we were successful in that. Um, a lot of good lobbyists out there, pro and con. Um, we, in economic matters, we deal with a lot of regulatory things as far as the insurance commissions and what have you. And we had to really go back and take a hard look. And, and one of the best things is if you take a look at a bill and you go to the fiscal note, you, you'll sit back and say, gee, this is where the problems go. Because we can sit down, and I think the senator mentioned the Augustine Commission, which was put together by uh, Governor O'Malley, a team from Governor O'Malley's group, to really address the businesses in the state. And they were sponsored, and our governor took those bills and said, these are bills that I think are good for our state. Um, there are probably five of them, and one of them that I voted and I tried to kill because it, it really had an open-ended fiscal note. You really didn't know where the dollars and cents were going. You were taking DBED and a bunch of other groups and putting them together, and everybody was going to be everybody. And when you looked at the bottom line note, it says, we can't determine that right now. And when you can't determine a fiscal note, that's probably a red flag for you. And you sit back and say, this might not be a good idea for the state. Um, all those things considered, I could talk about everything. You're going to get hear a lot of stories because we do these things. And when you have a, a set format that you're going to talk about and then somebody hears it yesterday or the day before, we tend to step on each other's toes a little bit. But I'll touch on the budget real quick, Jeff, and I'll try not to go real deep detail. Um, I was one of the 10 descending votes that didn't vote for the budget initially. And, and a lot of that came from, not that, not that voting for it or against it was a good idea or a bad idea, but I think based on, as a county commissioner in Queen Anne's County, we were faced with a, a deficit when we took office. And one of the issues we had with that was the pensions and how we fund the pensions. And my real heartburn with this was the fact that we were still taking money from the pensions. And that was something I was hoping that the Senate would address. And I think we, we talked a little bit, when that bill, when the budget came back to us, it wasn't the same budget, it wasn't Governor Hogan's budget. 
budget. It had about 154 amendments to it. So it, it, it ended up where we all agreed not to vote for that budget, and that's, that was a good thing for us because it really does not represent exactly what Governor Hogan really presented to us. Um, touch a little bit on some things that I'm working on right now, and I will be working. Um, I'm going to be working this summer with a, another delegate because he dubbed this year the Year of the Criminal. Um, I don't know if any of you get my newsletter, but it's really interesting to me that this year I think there was maybe one bill that actually mentioned a victim. The rest of the bills were we looked at expunging records. We have a bill out there. It was uh, the right to vote for ex-felons. And, and just to give you a little bit of an idea on that, an ex-felon is somebody that has served his time. It's paid, paid for his crime. He's gone through prison, and he's satisfied his parole. This bill was geared to felons, not ex-felons. And a simple thing on the floor was brought up, well, let's label the bill for what it is. Let's call it a right to vote for felons. And it got beaten because they didn't want the appearance that we were actually doing something for a felon. So now the felons are going to have a right to vote depending on the crime. I mean, certainly violent crimes won't be part of that. But the delegate put in an interesting uh, amendment to that bill. He says, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just take voting machines and put them into prisons? The good news is that got voted down. Um, the bad news is I think some people thought about it. And uh, it's really hard for me to sit back and continually make excuses. Uh, it, we had a bill out there called the second chance. Now, to me, the second chance is when my son throws a baseball in the house and it breaks a window, and, and I don't reprimand him for that. I say, okay, the next time you're going to get reprimanded. Well, this wasn't exactly about that. And, and, and don't misunderstand me. I, I really do believe in second chances. I think people can make a mistake. But these bills were geared that if you had 33 counts against you, 33 arrests against you, I could expunge them. And now the first or second time, yeah, you sit down, people make mistakes, but 33 times is no longer a mistake. It's a pattern. It's something that's happening. And that's real hard because, like I say, their people can be reformed, but I think that's why we have a judicial system to look at that and take a serious note at it and say, okay, what are the special circumstances and how can we help somebody? Um, we did put in a bill that, uh, or we didn't put it in, there was a bill that passed for, for criminals, ex-criminals that get out and to help them get into business. Um, some people didn't like that, but those are the types of things we really need to do. The people that go in and get reformed, they come out and they say, gee, I really want to do something with my life and I'm sorry for what I did and I'm truly regretting it. I will I think we should help that. But when you sit back and say, I'm just going to expunge it because, that's a little tough for somebody like me. And uh, we, we fought those types of bills and we looked at them and, and, and we really put a conscientious effort into how to stop them and not to stop them. Um, there was also a bill out there, and, and one of the things I think you look at here is when we start doing bills that make sense and don't make sense. Uh, we spoke yesterday about a bill that didn't get through, but it was just something simple for antique cars. Um, right now, to own an antique car, it's 20 years. And this might not matter to you, but it will take you a little bit when I, when I get to the end of it. And we upped that. The bill was pushing to make it 30 years. And part of the reason is, is that a 1995 car, you know, people, you see them around a lot. But one of the issues with it is, is that we see a lot of cars out there with historic plates. And I have one right now. I, I have a 1970 Corvette. And it's by no means uh, the car that my new car is. It's, by, it's not built that, that way. But people are using these historic plates for everyday drivers. And that's a problem because you get a reduced rate, you get insurance benefits, and uh, the car's cheaper to run. Um, and, and for most intents, they don't have all the uh, uh, pollution devices on it. But instead of fixing the problem, we want to address it by sitting down and saying, okay, we'll make it 30 years. Well, that, that really isn't going to address the problem we have with the historic plates being out there. And, and that, that always causes you a little bit of discon discontinuation. You don't want to really sit back and say, I, I don't disagree with the bill, but I don't agree with the bill. The other thing we, we looked at is in Maryland, you know, right now it's illegal in the Baltimore City to buy gasoline for a dirt bike. Doesn't make sense, but when you go to Baltimore City and you look at some of the problems they have with a bunch of motorcyclists, they get all these gangs on these dirt bikes and they're traveling down there. And, and the theory was that we'll fix this problem by making it illegal to buy gas for it. Well, you can't really police something like that. And I think a lot of the focus that we're going to be pushing on here is let's look at the root problem and really start trying to address the root problems try to, instead of putting a Band-Aid on the scab for cancer. And, and that's where we're really trying to get after. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of questions. You'll find out that most of us understand a lot about a lot of things and we're, we're addressing it. So I'll leave the rest to questions at the end of this. But I appreciate your time and I thank you all for letting us be here. Oh, one, one other thing. I think uh, Jay mentioned something like this. Uh, this is my second session, if you will. But uh, I was fortunate enough to be put on um, 
our caucus committee. We have an Eastern Shore caucus that now has grown. We've taken in part of Cecil County into our Eastern Shore caucus. So we're now a, a bigger group. We're able to present bills and fight bills and work bills as a group versus uh, just a smaller group that we were previous to this. I'm now part of the steering committee on our leadership. Uh, essentially, that means as, as we talked about bills and how they're fought, we're going to focus on the bills that are coming and have somebody review them because we only have 15 or 20 bills that we really fight hard on the floor. And we're going to try to find better ways of addressing them in committee and try to put the tools together to do that. Um, I'm the vice chair of the Eastern Shore Caucus, which means I just run the meeting if the chairman isn't there. So, And I do a pretty good job. I had to do it for like 15 minutes this year. So, But all that being said, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for your time. I appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Ahrens. And now we'll hear from our newest delegate, Delegate Jeff Greist. <coughs> All right, so the weather's really nice, isn't it? I mean, it's been like 60 degrees. I, I w I'd like to talk about the Orioles, too, but that's, uh, they, they're, uh, I'd rather not. That they lost the last four games, and it's not going too well for them either. Uh, but uh, now they always save the new, the new guy for last, and um, there's not a whole lot, not a whole lot to talk about. But uh, no, I, I agree with these guys. This, this has been a very, very good session. Um, for the most part, you know, uh, 88 out of the 90 days were very harmonious. Um, we all got along. Um, it was kumbaya for, for the most part. And um, if, if any of you all went into any of the forums last year, any of the candidate forums, when we were talking about how bad things were in the state of Maryland, um, it, it, it was true. Um, we certainly didn't. We weren't lying. Uh, we were certainly expressing our frustration. And, and, and we thought we had all the answers to, to the problems that, that faced us at the time. And... Um, for the for the most part, it's it's sort of been almost been a letdown for me because there was so much energy that was building during the campaign, and when we go in there, we even had um, a lot of the minority party killing their own bills. If there was a fiscal note on a lot of these bills, they were killing their their own bills um, because there was a very strong message that was sent by the voters in November, and I think for the most part. People got it. Um, there was a few people who didn't. Um, if, if you're a, a legislator from Tacoma Park or Germantown, um, you know their their constituents are quite a bit different than ours. Um, they don't mind paying a lot of taxes. You know, they want the best services that money can buy. Um, but I think for the rest of the state, though, um, where we do value um, the the money that we earn, um, and we do expect government to spend our money wisely, um, we did send a very strong mandate. And, and it was those legislators that killed their own bills. They killed their own party's bills for the most part. And that was a great thing. It was a great thing to see. And the reason why it was a letdown is because I wanted to go over there. I wanted to kill these bills. I didn't want them to kill them for me. I wanted to take credit for some of these things. Um, but, we, but it was good. Um, as these guys mentioned, I'm a, on the Appropriations Committee. We deal mostly with the budget. It's not a policy committee. It's not an exciting committee to be on. Uh, most of the people who testify are people who are in, are, are in need, uh, people with disabilities, poor people. Um, so it's a very serious committee, very serious issues that, that we deal with. But it's not the exciting issues. It's not the policy issues that, that, that we deal with. So, uh, But I did have a little bit of fun. Now, um, here's a, here's a good example of one of the the, uh, the bills that, that Jay was talking about. The it was a chicken tax bill. It was going to be five cent on every every chicken that was going to be produced, and the the sponsor of this bill was from Tacoma Park, a uh, new freshman delegate. And uh, we have these lunch uh, meetings just about every day for the for the first couple of months. And um, the, the way they set the room up, it's in a U, and you, you you eat at these desks, and they have like a buffet set up in, in the middle, and, and that legislator walks through, and, um, and they were serving chicken, of, of all things. And I said, uh, Moon, I yelled real loud so everybody could hear me. Everybody stopped talking. I said, Moon, I said, it's going to cost you five cents before you eat that chicken. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, chicken tax. I get, I get it. I get it. But uh, he's like, you know what? He says, I, you know, I'm a freshman. It was a freshman initiation. I have every intention of, of withdrawing that bill. Uh, but unfortunately for everybody who went over to testify, he waited until after the public hearing to do it. But, uh, but that's what you have to do. You have to f have fun with these guys. Um, and a lot of the times you, you kill these bills. You kill them in committee. You, you kill them. Um, sort of, um, you know, in, in, in the back, you know, in the offices and things like that. And, and we were very, very successful in, um, in, in doing that. And uh, the reason why you have to, um, this is certainly one of the takeaways that I've learned, is that if you don't kill them in committee and they make their way to the floor, the majority party is extremely disciplined. They, they vote green on bills and they vote red on amendments. 
And I'm telling you, they do it every single time. There was one time they didn't. <laughs> there was one bill um, that uh, some of the folks from Baltimore City, they stood up, they, they actually testified, they actually convinced their own members to vote against it. And guess what happened? Three days later, that bill resurrects itself. Then all of a sudden, it was the right along party lines. 91 people voted for it, 50 people voted against it. Uh, that just goes to show how the discipline is. So. Uh, you know, if we could say anything, if there's anything that you guys can take away from us, if there's any bills out there that relates to your business or, or anything like that, uh, we have to make sure we kill these things in committee. And one of the most successful ways to do it is phone calls. You know, these, 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 these I say poor delegates, but these, the delegate from Tacoma Park, he probably took thousands of phone calls, thousands of emails from all the stakeholders in the ag industry. Um, and I'm sure it started away on them too. So that, that's how you get things done in Annapolis. But it has to be done before you take that floor vote because it's, it's too late at, at that point. But, uh, but going back to the budget, there's not a whole lot more to really talk about. I think the Senator um, did a really nice job um, um, summarizing really what happened. Um, and it really, the budget really starts with the governor. Um, and we, we have to give him an awful lot of credit for shifting the direction um, that our state's headed. I think we can all agree that, that last year when we spend, our budget increases 5% and our revenues only increase 1.4%, there's a problem with that. That's deficit spending. And we when we're mandated, we're not the federal government, we can just print money, or we can borrow money from China. We are mandated by the Constitution to actually balance the budget. And then when we spend that much more than we take in, it creates big problems. Um, and so we have to change this, um, the direction that we're going. And what the governor did this year, our revenues are coming in about the same. It's about 3.4% increase. But our spend increase in spending is only 1.3%. That's great. So the difference is going to go to the structural deficit, and, and also the difference is going to go to our fund balance, which is a great thing. Um, so at, at the end of the day, um, again, even in my committee, um, I voted for it in, in my committee, the Appropriations Committee, the, the original um, budget that we passed, I voted for it uh, on the floor. And there were some things, and the reason why I did is because um, there were certain parts of the budget, the, the governor's budget that I didn't necessarily agree with too, and, and I fought very hard. One of them was medical adult daycare. Um, there were some cuts that the gov governor took in medical adult daycare that um, I fought for in our uh, Health and Human Services subcommittee that we ended up restoring. Um, and so we were successful in that. Some DDA money that, that I also fought for, um, that, that was also cut. Um, one of the unintended consequences last year, I think, uh, Senator mentioned uh, was when we raised the minimum wage. Um, well, the, the unintended consequences of that is a majority of the, the people who work in developmental disabilities, like the Benedictine School, most of those folks are, are minimum wage employees. Um, and so when you raise the minimum wage, it created problems where they were going to start laying people off. And it was mandated. Part of the deal was when they raised the minimum wage last year, part of the deal was is that future budgets was where they were going to see an increase of 3.5% in that budget. Um, well, the governor, um, to, to help balance the budget, which I appreciate, um, he, uh, he made some cuts there. So we ended up restoring that. So in order to find the money, um, we, we found all these different areas. Uh, we can't, in, in, in the General Assembly, we can't raise the budget. Uh, we can only cut it. Um, so what we did is we, we kept the governor's budget increase the same. We just basically rearranged the chairs. So I agree with a lot of different cuts. And, and part of those cuts that we made is I wanted to uh, shift that money into medical adult daycare, DDA, and, and a couple other things too. So, um, so I, was, I felt like I was successful in that. And that's part of the reason why I did vote for the budget. And it also did increase sales taxes um, as well, which is, which is a, uh, a, a tremendous success. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that I think that we, these guys also left off, one of the, the, the year of the criminal um, bills that did come through, and this is going to affect you guys, is uh, a bill that had to do with uh, shielding criminal records. Um, if, uh, how many of you guys in your business do you do background checks, criminal background checks? That's a lot, just about probably three quarters of you do. Um, basically now for, for a lot of businesses, um, you can still do background checks, but if somebody has a criminal record, um, they can go to a judge and have those criminal records shielded. Um, now, there are certain exceptions like government agencies, uh, the medical industry, and, and, and some others. But if you, if you have a retail industry, if you have a real estate, you're in the real estate business, um, and you go to do a criminal background check online, um, you're not exempted. Um, and you're, you're not going to be able to see the, uh, uh, the criminal records of a potential um, uh, uh, employees. So uh, we, did, we did our very best. We offered I many amendments, I mean at least a dozen amendments throughout the entire, for the second um, reader and, and then the, the third reader on uh, the Senate version. Um, but again, they vote green on bills, red on amendments. So we were very unsuccessful in, in even trying to make that bill better. But, uh, but overall, um, 
man, this has been an, an outstanding experience. Um, I, you know, it's like I said, for for 88 days out of the session, um, built a lot of friendships, uh, and and it's been. Um, a very successful session um, so far. Now next year, it, it might be different um, because we do have so many new members. Uh, we, as a new member, you can't do anything until you're sworn in. Um, so basically what we did, the 60 some new members, you, you have to get your office set up. Uh, you have to um, you have to get your feet wet and it takes a couple weeks. I mean, you really, you only have three or four weeks to get any bills put in, but now we have the interim. Um, we have an entire year to figure out exactly what we want to accomplish. And so there's 60 some odd members, they're going to have an agenda next year. Um, so I have a feeling that next year's session will probably, um, be a little bit more challenging than this one. Um, but certainly our focus is going to, going to be the same and in being on the appropriations committee, I, there's not a, any other committee that I would want to be on. Um, cause certainly I'm going to defend the governor's agenda because we have to, um, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, the governor wanted to, uh, to reduce the structural deficit in half. Um, these guys, they, the majority party, they dug their heels in, um, and with this GCI, um, and part of the reason why you guys probably heard the last couple days of the session, we talked about it here. Um, the reason why. <coughs> things went south is because the when the Saturday before Sonny died, the governor made a very, very reasonable um, compromise. Um, the governor cut GCI in half. He said, you know what, I'll restore three quarters. Uh, and those guys dug their heels in and and um, so, so did we. Um, but uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still good. So uh, look forward to, uh, like these said, look forward to any questions. And I, I appreciate this opportunity that you guys have given me. Um, and, and I know these guys do as well. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Christ. And now we'll have our um, Commission President, Jim Moran, speak to us. Well, good morning. I'd first like to say that, uh, you know, it, it's, the morning's dragging a little bit here, but I, I, I got to say that our delegates and our senator working with a Republican governor and all these business owners in here and no new taxes, that's a huge win. That's a huge win. And I'd like to say thank you very much. I mean, you guys are doing a great job. You know, so, so uh, I was asked to, to report on what we've been doing here in Queen Anne's County, and I'm, I'm glad to see that Commissioner Comfort and Commissioner Anderson are here. Uh, so I'm going to basically read down what's been going on in government in Queen Anne's County. Uh, one of the first things that was done uh, with a four to one vote was uh, repealing the, the beach permit fee. Uh, so we, you know, that was, that was coming out of the gate. And the second thing, we joined the Clean Chesapeake Coalition. And I think that was a good thing for Queen Anne's County. Um, then we started in on reorganization. Uh, and what, what, is, what has gone on, uh, Delegate Arntz, uh, had the dubious task uh, when he was up here uh, as a commissioner in it, to do the heavy lifting for Queen Anne's County, uh, taking us through the difficult times with those commissioners, uh, having to raise taxes, balance the budget, and now we are the recipients of that. So, you know, we, we, things are getting much better financially for the county, and we're, we're able to restore some of the positions that we had to cut loose to make the government run more efficiently. So, for instance, Parks now sits on its own. It's a standalone. Uh, we have parks, and under parks, we have the landings, marinas, Blue Heron Golf Course, and the Bay Bridge Airport. And all that is run by Chip Price. And if a lot of you don't know who Chip is, he ran Project Open Space for the state. And what that does is helps us, as a county, get funding for a lot of different things. And that's a good thing. It's, again, we're not using our money. We're using the state's money. Uh, we uh, also uh, economic development for the first time ever it's a standalone in the county so it's it and we've hired uh, Jamie Gilbert to run economic development community fairs Ms. Faith Elliott Rosing here is, is running that and under that we have tourism and QAC TV uh, we've uh, created the following funds the franchise fee fund that we get from broadband funds QAC TV so you're going to see a lot of improvements there. We're bringing back the, the sports, bringing back a lot of on-site uh, filming of different events. And I think that's a great way for the county. And we're looking for suggestions. So if you have things that you think that we need to put on there, please call us and, and we would entertain that to, to put that on there. Our hotel tax that we have right now, 
35% of it goes to tourism, 65% of it goes to our economic development. That's a dedicated funding so that that money is always there because as you know, those two bring in money and revenue and jobs to the county and we want to protect that and make sure that's always there. So that's, that's a dedicated fund. Uh, we've created a county finance committee. So we have three sets of eyes looking at all times at our finances. And again, that's not something that's cost us anything. It's, it's voluntary, but this allows us to have more eyes, more ideas, keep a watch so that we don't get in any trouble financially. Uh, we have the same thing with a procurement committee. So we have a procurement committee also that when we're doing some spending, if, if there's ways to save money and we have some fresh eyes on that, we want to be able to do that also. So we have a procurement now. Uh, we have also reestablished the July 4th fireworks. So we're going to have fireworks uh, this year at the Kent Narrows. And uh, that's in a partnership with the, uh, the Yacht Club and, and a bunch of businesses. And that's going to be, I think it's, you know, normally we have, I think, three or four inch shells. Uh, this year they're going to 10 inch shells. So you might be able to see these from Washington, D.C. I, I don't know. But it's, it's, it's going to be a big, big hoo ha ha. But uh, come early because the parking is going to be limited. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm proud of and, and that we are moving forward with is the Southern Kent Island Sewer Project. As you know, we've approved the engineering for that. So we are moving forward with that and we are, as you know, we're, we're, the main trunk is going down and we're starting at the end and working our way back because that's where the major problems exist, is at the very end of that. Uh, we've, you know, we're in the process now of hiring additional staff for the parks, DPW, and we've hired risk, a risk manager and HR specialist and some more people for QAC TV. These were all positions that, we were, that had been empty for two to three years, just been vacant and we've had double duty and, and frankly some of it just wasn't getting done. So now we're back in the process of getting these things taken care of. Uh, we, we had a, last year uh, some emergency funding for uh, PFY of 25,000 uh, and the why. The why is it's not dead. It's in, I don't want to call it limbo, but uh, we're going to be having a meeting probably towards the end of May with the board at the Y. Uh, right now, the, as it stands, uh, we have deeded the land to them. No cash, but deeding the land to them with the, them raising the money for the, the building itself. Don't know how that's going to come out yet. Uh, so we're going to get together in a room, and, and the bottom line is the two boards are going to get together. If a deal can't be struck, then there's, there will not be a why. But, you know, it's gone on long enough. I've, I've asked for the meeting. I said, look, at the meeting's going to take as long as it's going to take, but it's going to be done. It's going to be done one way or the other. So, you know, this, is, this, this will be coming the end of, probably towards the end of May. Um, we've hired a new planning and zoning director. As, as a lot of people know, Steve Cahoon has gone over to DPW because he is running the Southern Kent Island Sewer Project. There's a lot of engineering that goes on with that, and he's dedicated to that and other projects that we need him on for DPW. So Michael Wisnoski will be starting. Uh, he lives in Annapolis now. He's, he's uh, more than qualified and, and he has experience on both sides of the table because he did some development in New Jersey. So, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a win because we talk about how can we shorten the permits for businesses coming here. And I think that this gives us that advantage because he's worked on that side. So I think that's a big advantage for the county. Um, Yesterday, we implemented our first Earth Day. We had about 10% of our roads that were uh, adopted, collected a lot of cha uh, trash. Channel 2 came over, gave us a little coverage for the 530 News. And so we're going to move forward with this, and maybe we're going to make this an annual thing. So, you know, I, I look at 50,000 people in the county, uh, one trash bag a person, that's a whole lot of trash. So, you know, if, if you can get involved next year or any time during the year, you know, we pick it up because it all ends up in our, water our waterways. Uh, and also, uh, in this budget cycle, we have a uh, million dollars in for our WIP funding, which is our water implementation plan. As you know, that uh, the, the state and the federal government's mandated cleaning up, reducing our TMDLs that go into the, to our, our tributaries, our rivers, and our, and our bay. That one million dollars that we're putting in there this year, and we have it for next year also, that if we approve it in the budget, we'll get matching grants of up to four million dollars. So that's five million dollars a year that we'll be able to put in to cleaning up our waterways. That money's been sitting there for years. A lot of counties, a lot of jurisdictions aren't taking advantage of it. I'd like to take advantage of it because right now we can get the biggest bang for our buck. And uh, sooner or later, the, as, as the deadlines come, that money's, people are gonna have to, counties are gonna have to start spending money on their whips 
and uh, that money won't be there. So you know, we're trying to get ahead of the game with that. Um, Let's see. Uh, and the only thing I would like to say too is, is to our delegates and our senator. You know, you guys are doing such a good job, but uh, you know, I know it takes a while to turn an aircraft carrier around. I think we're headed in the right direction, and I'm just going to beg you a little bit for some highway user revenues if you get an opportunity. And with that, that's that's, that's really all I have to say. And, and and thank everybody for coming. And and again, I know there'll be questions. Thank you.